Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Very good morning from Jakarta, Bangkok, and also everywhere you are in this uh, Zoom cloud meeting. First, we thank to our Indian Super God, to our healthy and happiness that we all together can join this uh, important and probable event. Uh, I'm Dharma Tintri, alumni from uh, SOM, School of Management, uh, Management of Technology, 1993. Uh, hello, uh, everyone. Today, I'm moderating this uh, Alpinja. Uh, Honorable Vice President AIT, Dr. Nafit Anwar. Honorable to all wonderful speaker, all finalists, and all very good uh, participants of global webinar in digital transformation in banking industry 2021. This webinar is part of alumni talk series, which is uh, organized by IIT Graduate Club, IIT Alumni Association, IIT Extension, and IIT Solution. For the last but not least, is a last uh, dedicated program for our dear former president of IIT Alumni Association, Mrs. Fe Gracia Garcia Mestro, thank you. And then welcome to our dear new president of AIT Alumni Association, Kun Tawichai. Uh, this global webinar was attended uh, by more than 55 uh, participants registered uh, from around Asia, especially Thailand, Indonesia, uh, Philippines, Singapore, Sri Lanka, and so on. As we know uh, now, uh, technology revolution, especially uh, revolution industry 4.0 and society 5.0, uh, in particular digital transformation is uh, growing at an exponential rate, which lead to the emergence of innovative business model and market ecosystem. COVID-19 accelerated digital transformation by forcing us to innovate and creative in online activities. Even though there are rotation on the mobility of people and activities such as lockdown. Advanced technologies such as uh, blockchain, IoT, internet opting, artificial intelligence, AI, and robotic have become mature enough to create disruption in banking and finance industry, both uh, conventional and Islamic finance industry, namely digital banking. The main objective of this global webinar is to describe uh, prospect and opportunity in the future and challenges of the digital transformation in the finance industry, especially the potential for a uh, large impact of the both conventional banking and uh, Islamic banking industry and its stakeholder. This potential impact uh, exists into perspective, positive uh, side and negative side. All right, so we start our agenda with an opening remark, but uh, Dr. Nafet, please take away. Okay, I'm... Dr. Nafet is a oh, yes. <laughs> doctor, uh, engineering and academician is the press president of knowledge transfer and the Asian Institute of Technology, AIT. During 22 years of work in AIT in various capacity, he has uh, did and participated in several important initiatives, including uh, establishment of AIT Enterprise Alliance, AIT Entrepreneurship Center, ASEAN Center for Engineering, Computation and Software, ACACOMS, AIT Solution and Innovation Lab. He has been uh, in jail as a specialist by uh, ADB, ASEAN Department Bank, World Bank, UNESCO, UNESCO, USAID, and has been part of the team of California Best Computer and Structure Incorporation. 
He has taught several courses and supervised research comprising of new trend and technology in structural engineering. Okay, Dr. Nafet, time is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, I'm really good, good morning, everyone, and uh, a warm welcome from AIT here. And thank you so much for inviting me uh, to this very, very important uh, webinar addressing uh, key, uh, I, I think, topics which are facing many industries and banking and finance, especially. So first of all, a few things about the Graduate Club. Uh, I, we actually launched this Graduate Club about two years ago, just before the COVID was, uh, you know, it wasn't really there at that time. We thought this would be a very good place for our alumni to come back to AIT and visit us. And then we will have a home for them on campus, a specially dedicated area for them to, to, to stay, to meet, to uh, socially interact, and also to, 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 to do some professional work if they want to do that. And unfortunately, once we launched that, um, the physical travel was restricted. And then we started the series of these online talks, expert talks. And then last year, we did several of them. And then this year, we are, you know, this is one of the major talks that we are organizing. And we are very hopeful that next year, it seems that the travel will be opening. And we would like to welcome uh, our colleagues, alumni, to visit AIT. Anytime they are in Bangkok and this region, please let us know. We will welcome you to campus, bring you on, on uh, into the graduate club, and then we can have physical interaction meetings with yourself, with faculty, with students, and so on. So we really look forward to welcoming you to AIT as soon as the travel starts and you start traveling <coughs> back to Thailand uh, or visit, visit Bangkok. And then coming back to this um, important uh, event that we are doing today, I think this is really something that uh, uh, almost all industries are, uh, are grappling with how to uh, you know, transform themselves to, to adopt uh, as well as adapt to the digital transformations happening uh, rapidly in, 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 this, in this arena. Uh, in, in, in my own field, instruction learning, we are just also looking at how we can increase the digital uh, technologies, uh, you know, bringing in all of these things, blockchain and AI and data analytics back into the traditional fields of engineering. Banking and finance, and, 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 and you know, this is actually at the forefront, as you know, of this development of um, uh, digital tools. And in, in fact, AIT recognized this, uh, that the importance of this particular theme, and that's why AIT has launched several new programs which address some of these topics. For example, uh, we used to have a professional program in banking and finance, which has been quite going on for a long time. It's still a popular program, but we also launched, uh, you know, uh, like this year, a program in the business analytics and digital transformation professional program and a regular program, and then combine them with the banking and finance. So ART, you know, is is trying is keeping up with the time and uh, developing new programs. We also launched another program in in the computer science, which focuses on data analytics uh, as well. So I think the application of digital technologies and and data analytics, all of that, including I'd like like to mention uh, IoT. Uh, blockchain uh, and uh, all of the related technologies is something that every every discipline uh, protect, practicing professionals have to now address. And I'm really glad that this theme has been uh, sort of identified for this webinar. And we have very esteemed speakers. And I look at the presentation; they're absolutely very interesting. And I'm sure that our alumni and even people outside this group will benefit from this discussion. So I would like to once again thank all of the uh, organizers of this event, uh, especially Ms. Fay, uh, which who have I've worked with very closely for many years. We have really enjoyed working with her, and I wish she could have continued for another two terms uh, as the uh, alumni president because in, during her time many things have happened uh, actively, and we are really glad. And I'm sure the new the, the incoming president will continue many of those activities, and we are very you know looking forward to working with the Alumni Association, continue to work with them because the Graduate Club is a joint um, uh, project or a joint launch between AIT and AIT Alumni Association. So it's one common platform where we can bring AIT's current uh, students and management and faculty together with the uh, graduates that we have all over the world. So uh, once again, on behalf of AIT, uh, I would like to welcome everyone to this webinar and uh, I wish that this discussion will be very fruitful. 
and it will it will serve as a springboard to many of the activities that we could do in, in the future. So thank you once again, and um, please uh, accept my congratulations and welcome. Thank you very much, Dr. Lopez. Uh, and now we can start the plenary session by uh, delivered by three wonderful uh, speakers, um, Mrs. Maria Feniors of uh, Ferro, with topic from past book ledger to digital ledger, from banking license to digital banking license in the Philippines. So maybe Fay will uh, deliver about uh, part of uh, history of banking from traditional banking into open banking uh, till uh, uh, banking for four. If we are refer to a uh, book of uh, Brad King, uh, banking for four. Maybe okay, uh, Mrs. Fay, time is short. Thank you very much, Dharma. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, I'd like to share my screen. Yeah, okay, okay, thank you. Uh, I would like to discuss this morning uh, our experience in the Philippines about uh, the banking progress in digital transformation. You know, uh, five months before that date, I was uh, given the assignment to make a choice between uh, two banks that I have been servicing because there was a very tight competition among the banks on which one will be first certified to go into an internet banking using ATMs. And there was a competition between two groups on which of these two groups of banks will first come to uh, the live setup of an internet banking. So in the afternoon of uh, February, a group of us were huddled in front of the lobby of uh, the Philippine National Bank, that is the biggest bank in the country. And uh, uh, previous to that, uh, we had to plan on how to put a front end processor to their back end mainframe. And so what we did was to get uh, to order a front end processor because it was nearly Christmas time. And uh, there was just so much uh, uh, packages coming from abroad. I had to send somebody to Hong Kong to actually bring in the machine as a hand carried item as big as a refrigerator. And then uh, it arrived between Christmas and New Year. We were able to install it on January 11. And from January 11 to February 19, we were actually almost having no sleep just to make sure that uh, the money will come out of the ATM. So that afternoon, what happened? Finally, we were waiting for our bated breath, and then money came out of the ATM from an account that was not owned by the Philippine National Bank, but by Equitable Bank. And so it was the very first uh, ATM transaction in the country. Then in 31 December 1999, I think most of you were uh, present there. We were all again waiting for bated breath. Why? We were slightly, uh, we were inviting, uh, we were trying to uh, see what's happening in New Zealand because of the Y2K, then Sydney, then Melbourne, Tokyo, Seoul, and then it reached the Philippines. The Y2K happened and everything was quiet. There was no issue. Six months after that, in June of that year, we again were waiting in bated breath. Why? What came out was our first project on bills, presentment, and payment. It was the first internet uh, financial uh, transaction that happened over the internet. How did this all come about? So in March 2020, and that was just last year, 
we were we could not leave home we were on a lockdown and then up to this time we have to buy online we have to get the deliveries online everything is online on payments and everything is online banking we got to this because in 1969 when i was in grade six the first uh hardware for banking was used by uh, the china banking corporation and then while i was studying for my masters in ait in 1981 the philippines installed the first atm with the bank of philippine islands then Nine years after that, that was the story. We had the first interbank network, the ATM switch of Megalink, and the Philippine National Bank, which was my project, was the first one certified ever in a switch environment. And then uh, the next year in 1991, we had to install the first ATM pin security devices. And suddenly all the banks in the Philippines, except for two, became my clients because we were supplying these de devices. In 1993, we were able to put together the first debit bills payment for point of sale. And it was the first cashless transaction that we had in the Philippines. And then in 1994, we had the phone banking, then the first interconnection of interbank networks, then uh, an interbank link up with credit cards. So more of cashless transactions. And then finally in 1999, almost nine years after that we had the first banking data warehousing and analytics system so that banks the bank will know who is their uh, lender and who is the borrower so who is the net borrower and net depositor so using this analytics system and then banks started to do their back office automation, their financials, inventory, HR, payroll. And then in the year 2000, we had the first bills, presentment, and payment over the internet. So this is the first use of the internet in banking. Then we had the mobile banking service, interbank funds transfer all throughout the year 2000. And then in 2008, we had the cross-border transactions of ATM and POS with Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, and Thailand. So we, we went beyond the Philippines. And then we had the merger of all the ATM interbank networks, Megalink and BankNet. Then we have the 2020. Now, the, the Banco Central ng Pilipinas issued the guidelines on the establishment of digital banks. We have the general banking law that was actually revised in the year 2000. And if you take a look at this, this GPL, there are actually 10 chapters in all, all so many pages basically telling how the banks can organize themselves, how they how deposits and other operations loans can actually be carried out by the different types of banks in the philippines and what is important here is that this law was made to ensure that uh, all the stakeholders of the banks are protected whether they are the shareholders and whether they are the officers and whether they are actually the clients of the bank. So it's basically ensuring the protection of all the stakeholders of a bank. And these are the types of banks that we have in the Philippines. We have uh, universal banks, commercial banks, the thrift banks, that's uh, the smaller banks, basically, the Savings and Loans Association and the private development banks. They called it the thrift banks. We also have the cooperative banks. Uh, these are normally uh, by groups of uh, agriculture or maybe a specific group of uh, people who are forming a cooperative. Then we have the Islamic banks. And this is, again, covered by another Republic Act uh, or another law. And then we have the government-owned banks and the other classification of banks as determined by the Monetary Board of the Banco Central ng Pilipinas. Um, these are the pawn shops, the microfinance uh, institutes, and uh, all other lending facilities. 
Now, because of the computerization that has been happening through through the years, no? uh, and uh, it's basically also like my uh, my career uh, spanning from uh, the last 30, 40 years now, uh, the major banks are offering the account inquiry or deposit loans, credit cards, funds transfer, bills payment, customer services, uh, like the stop payment of a, a check or a, ordering a check, and some more information about the various products and services of the banks. Of course, uh, some special services have been added, like uh, you don't have to be in a queue, you can just schedule your banking transactions when you want that to happen, foreign exchange, and the prepaid mob mobile phones. Uh, in 2000, we actually were a, a part of the team that developed the, the topping up of the prepaid mobile phones of uh, uh, several telcos. And, uh, this time, instead of paying somebody directly, then you can just reload online. And uh, we have the online account applications and electronic statements. So suddenly you don't even have to have your passbook because everything is now electronic in terms of your statement and all your transactions. And then there are more advanced internet banking transactions, your investment account inquiry, uh, your subscription for your investment plans, and uh, of course your mobile applications for banking and mobile payments. So uh, BSP then issued the guidelines in the establishment of digital banks. And what is a digital bank? It offers financial products and services that are processed end to end through a digital platform and or electronic channels with no physical branch and branch or a branch like unit offering the same. So a digital bank is the digitization of every level of banking from the front end to the back end. In other words, a digital bank should be able to facilitate all levels of banking functionality across all service delivery platforms. So if you take a look at this, then uh, operations in the front office, these are what is seen, what are seen by the clients. And this is what's happening at the back. And to put this in place, you have to have your own hardware infrastructure. But nowadays, you don't even have to have your hardware infra infrastructure on site because you can have it on the cloud. But more importantly, how do you put them together? You have to have an, an, an orchestration platform to put all of this together. And on top of this, make sure that every part of this is secure. So you have to take a look at what's happening in the whole bank in your, if you are a digital bank and these are all automated. From the front end, banking activities should have the same functions as banking services to be visible to customers. Uh, so whether they, it's head office or branch office or online service, it has to be transparent. And while from the back end, all the banking activities happen in front, that happening in the front end should be visible to the bank employees through their service and server and admin control panel. So therefore, digital banks need to utilize technology to automate the administrative tasks, the data processing, so there's less pressure on the employees. In terms of services, how would you how would you differentiate a conventional bank and a digital bank? There's no significant difference because the same services are offered in terms of savings, deposits, withdrawals, transfer investments, and loans. The difference lies in the form. A conventional bank will have a physical form. You'll have to have the head office and the branches. While in digital banks, you don't see them. You only have the head office, but then uh, you do not require the presence in a branch office. In addition, usually the other differences are found in visible and other advantages offered. Examples include lower administrative fees. You don't have real property management of branches because there's no branch. You need less personnel and cheaper or even transfer fees and higher interest rates. So, but there are challenges. 
in the digital transformation strategy, you have to have a solutions architecture and technology options. There are just so many. You have to take a look at your organization and change management and customer experience and growth. What do you want to give them? What is, how do you optimize your service? Your underwriting concerns. How do you manage the volume, the speed of delivery and the risk? Because there is a risk in collection and recovery. How do you collect online? And of course, there's always the regulatory requirement from the Banco Central and the risk that's attached with all the processes that you put in place. And more importantly, how do you secure the data that you have? So the next wave of banking, they call it neo banking or digital banking, it will be fully online, cashless, branchless alternatives to conventional banks, which aim to offer the best customer experience all contained in your mobile application so everything is on the phone so in the philippines only six banks so far have been given this digital uh, license digital bank license union bank is the only existing bank that has been given all the other five banks are new so we still have to see how they will perform. And they're given three years to actually put in place a total digital bank. So hearing from my friend Ramon Hoxon, who is the uh, CEO of the oldest bank in the Philippines that was created even during the Spanish time, he said, digital transformation is not just about applying technology tools. It is about changing the way we think of ourselves and our place in customers' lives. With our digital ecosystem, we are trying to influence our clients to adopt digital behaviors and develop a digital culture. And from another batchmate in the UP, the BSP uh, Deputy Governor Diwa Ginugundo, he said, we have to put in place policy and regulatory frameworks for the use and acceptability of financial technology. Since this is new to us, we have opted for Sandbach's approach so that we can test value propositions and allow them to evolve over time until we are completely convinced the idea is feasible and socially useful. So how is it now with the Philippine banks? Banks in the Philippines have all the necessary tools and supportive regulatory environment to lead the country into a new era of digital banking. To start this journey and to exploit the opportunities, banks have to focus on and invest in their digital strategy, which should involve not only technology, but most importantly, process and organizational re-engineering. This is a holistic approach. And while there are risk factors, the truth is that change is inevitable, whether the banks are ready or not. So given that, thank you very much. And let's hear from the other speakers. Thank you very much, uh, Faye. Uh, it's very inside presentation, but uh, I apologize. Uh, now I'm reading your thought uh, bio. Uh, Ms. Faye Ferrell has more than 40 years of experience in the field of information technology, IT. At present, she is the president of Correlate uh, Incorporation, an IT solution provider that uh, is in the business of offering various of IT solution, product, and services using the Correlate uh, orchestration platform. She has worked in the private and government sector in various capacities as an IT business executive, IT consultant, IT solution integrator, sales and marketing executive, project manage, uh, manager, system analyst, programmer, educator, and student. She has designed, implemented, and supported IT solution for Philippine bank, telcos, manufacturing firm, government agency, and educational institution. For the banking sector, uh, she has implemented online tellering and ITM solution, pin security, DeFi solution, online bill, resentment and payment system, payment gateway, 
connectivity, VSL, data warehouse, and analytic solution and network solution. She has provided IT consulting services and change management training and inter pension for being employed across the country. So it's uh, uh, correlate in for principle of banking, utility is king. Yeah. Okay, next uh, speaker is uh, Mr. Tony. Yep. Uh, Mr. Tony, okay. Uh, with topic regulation and digital banking uh, blueprint in Indonesia. Please time is your. Okay, thank you, Ms. Derma. Uh, the, the Honorable Dr. Nafer Anwar, Vice President for Knowledge Transformation Institute of Technology, Ms. Maria Fay, Ms. Sripeni Puspasari, Ms. Ahmad Shafi, Prof. Dharma, Dr. Konrad, and all participants in this webinar. Good morning to your all. First of all, let us give praise to God Almighty for his blessing and grace so that we can join today webinar in good health. And today health is uh, quite expensive because during the pandemic, there are so many concerns about the health. And I would like also to thank the Global Asian Financial Institute of Technology Alumni Association for inviting me to speak today. And also I would like to thank the organizing committee of this webinar. I'm really pleased and honored to be here and speak in this forum to deliver digital banking blueprint in Indonesia for the next 15 minutes. It seems that the webinar has become one of the new normal for us now. And it also connect us from many other countries to join a, one platform in, and also to enjoy the discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, as we know, uh, maybe next slide, Indonesian is known as one of the fastest growing digital economy in Southeast Asia. And this is according to Bain, Temasek, and Google. They recently published an economic 2021 report. In this report, they show that Indonesian internet economy has reached around 70 billion US dollar in 2021. And it will increase up to 146 billion US dollar in 2025. That number signified an optimist outlook of, for the populist notion. And Indonesia has seen 21 million new digital customers since the start of the pandemic. If we look at the growth per sector, they experienced double digit growth in 2021 with e-commerce leading the pack. The survey also indicate that consumers continue, continue using digital service to make them easier and convenient. Those numbers are important signal for banking industry that they must utilize that opportunity to transform themselves into digital banking. Next slide, probably. Digital transformation in the financial sector can, uh, from our research, is usually driven by two factors, namely digital opportunity and digital behavior. We can mention several factors supporting Indonesian digital opportunity, such as the increase of internet user penetration, demographic dividend, and the rise of financial technology that can support digitization in the financial service sector. And also in addition to digital opportunity indicator, there are several digital behavior indicator that support digital transformation, such as ownership of device that increased tremendously in Indonesia in several years. And then the internet uh, usage also increased that usually in Indonesia, you, they use more than an hour for internet. And then in average, people in Indonesia also use social media for two hours. And then they also play a uh, game console for one hour. And then we can also see the use of mobile app in Indonesia, such as chat apps, social media, shopping app, banking app, have become one of the daily routine for those people in Indonesia. And it seems like most of the people enjoy the trans economy transaction through digital currently. And it has become the uh, big opportunity for bank to tap in into the digital world. And next slide. In Indonesia, the banking already takes step to transform themselves into the digital world. And you can see the digital transaction in Indonesia and also the number of the declining uh, office in the in commercial bank. 
from 2015 until now, we see that the number of the commercial bank office or the branch are decreasing tremendously, it's like almost 2,000, uh, more than 2,000 office already closed in Indonesia. This is happened because the bank transformed themselves into the digital. So they just provide the service through the digital mobile app, internet uh, banking, and we can also look at the number of the digital banking transaction. It increased tremendously in several in the couple of years. And also it's similar to the projection of e-commerce transaction that also increased. And it's similarly with the electronic money transaction. It shows us that the Indonesian currently have evolved from the physical transaction and move forward to the digital transaction. That's why the transaction in the digital banking also increased tremendously in the next couple of years. And then, next slide. What happened in the banking sector that we see and what happened in the future for the Indonesian banking sector, we see like uh, from the several research, we see that the banking business model may change in the futures. There are three types of banking models that will uh, become one of the prominent models in the future. This is, we call it as the banking bank center, which is the bank as the super app and, control, and controlling the entire ecosystem of the digital economy. And the other one is banking ecosystem, which means that bank become the part of the digital ecosystem connected through the API. And also the third one is the platformication, which is the bank as the marketplace and then they can just easily uh, using plug and play. It means like uh, one there is a fan, uh, the third party want to join into the bank app, they can easily enter or they can actually exit from the app. This is what we call it the platformification as the plug and play. And the other aspect that we see in the next uh, e coming year is that the, there are several uh, key uh, element that important for the banking sector. The first is data, and the second one is the business model that will be changed, and the third one is regulation, and the fourth is technology. When we talk about the data, the banking in the future is, is not only uh, become the place where we put our money, but this is also the place where we put our data. This includes our financial data, and the data become the most important part in the world, and is. Some people call it data is as new oil or the more expensive than the gold in the futures. And then of course, with the use of data, it will change the business model of the bank. They will, they will become more digitized and also uh, try to change the way they uh, provide service to the customer. And of course, with the changing of the current environment, the regulation must also change. This means the regulation can no longer become the barrier for the development of the uh, digital economy, but the regulation must become facilitative to develop the digital economy in the futures. And then the technology also shape the world, uh, uh, back to the previous slide, the technology also shape the transformation of the digital bank. As we can see currently there are several new technology emerged in the market, such as artificial intelligence, machine learning, distributed ledger technology, biometric, cloud computing, internet of things, augmented reality, and also quantum computing. And this technology, of course, will change the way the banks uh, provide service to the customer. And currently, we also heard about the metaverse, which is under development by the Facebook, the Microsoft. And we think that the metaverse may become one of the prominent features in the, in the, in the futures. And this is also when it become the prominent features. Of course, it will also the change the way how the bank will operate and provide service to the customer. And this is the way uh, the, what we see as uh, of the one of the big challenge for the banking industry that the bank should be able to adapt to the new condition in the current situation, which some people call it as FUCA. And for the next slide. And this is several challenges that we already identify when the bank want to transform into digital banking. We see that the first is like the customer data protection and data transfer. It become of the challenge how the banks will provide, uh, should 
protect their customer data and there is some how they also prudent uh, provide data transfer data to other party of course uh, with the consider with the consent from the customer and then the second one we see that is strategy creates about the IT investment how the bank uh, can properly choose which technology they should adapt and invest into the technology and of course it should be aligned with their business strategy and the third one is about the cyber security risk this also become of the prominent risk in the recent year the cyber security attack has increased in the couple of years and become of the major risk in the banking sector or the financial sector and the third one is about the organizational readiness to support digital transformation this is also become one of the challenge for the bank because previously bank has the conventional way to deliver service and they want to change into digital uh, uh, world of course it will need the digital talent digital leadership digital culture and also new organizational design and then the, the other risk is the both the customer data leakage this also become of the problem and then the fourth one uh, the, the other one is the about the misuse of technology risk this is about the how the bank should uh, carefully uh, adopt the tech, new technology but they use it in the proper way so there is no misuse of the uh, of the new technology such as especially like artificial intelligence and the other one is about the third party risk which is outsourcing this is also important risk because when the bank rely heavily on the one vendor if there is something happen with the IT vendor of course it will also become the problem for the operational of the bank and the 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 two last one is like about the communication network infrastructure which is still uh, is being developed by the government today because in indonesia this is a, we have like the so many islands and there are so many remote area where they, are, they are still part of indonesia they still doesn't have the communication network and i i believe that the government is still working on that to provide the communication network all over Indonesia. And then the last one is about the regulatory framework, which is still unfavorable for the uh, banking sector because some said like this is still become uh, our hindrance uh, to develop the new product or something. And that's why we in, in Indonesia try to change our regulatory framework. I will see you in the next slide. Next slide, Asa. And of course, uh, our policy in OJK as the Indonesian Financial Service Authority, we try to support the banking digitalization through the, our uh, reform, regulatory and supervisory reform. In our regulatory reform, we try to use the three uh, principal uh, approach, which is the one is the principle based by providing regulation in the form of guiding principle to give opportunity for the industry to develop the new innovation. And the second one is the, we, we will also provide a facilitation for the industry, which means that we will facilitating and encouraging digital innovation without, of course, undermining the prudential principle. And the third one is that the, we will also provide guidance as the living document to accommodating banking business development in the futures because we see like the banking is changing rapidly currently due to the technology and next slide Elsa uh, ladies and gentlemen uh, to support our banking uh, industry in uh, 2020 the, in the end of 2020 we already uh, issued the, what we call it roadmap of Indonesian banking development 2020 until 2025 in the second pillar you see that we have like uh, accelerating digital transformation it compromised four elements this is like the when we talk about accelerating digital transformation we want to support the digital transformation of Indonesian banking industry but in order to do so, we will ask the bank to strengthen their IT governance and IT risk management. Also, we also encourage the use of IT game changer, we call it. This is like the new te uh, technology that may change or shape the way the bank provides service to the industry. And the fourth one is also we will encourage technology related collaboration. This is between the bank and e-commerce, between the bank and fintech. 
and also between the bank with other uh, small medium enterprise so they can also bring them to the technology economy and the fourth one is also we encouraging the implementation of advanced digital bank and our uh, second pillar is we already also provide another detailed guidance on how we uh, will uh, change the regulation in indonesia the, in the next slide yeah, we are uh, in like this year we are already uh, issued what we call it as blueprint for digital transformation in banking basically the uh, blueprint has the several principle we call it as balance which means like we want to encourage the innovation and facilitation without compromising prudential safe and sound banking and this is we call it balance between innovation and prudent and safe and sound banking and then the second one is we are technological neutral in our blueprint which means that we're not focusing on a particular technology instead we are focusing on the key element uh, of the banking the, the digitalization transformation process and the for the third one is the transformation element that compromised that people process and technology and this is the basically the principle underlying our blueprint in indonesia and the blueprint compromised like we five element this is the data it's mean like when we talk about data it's mean like the, we call it the data protection data transfer and data governance and also the second element is technology it cover it governance technology architecture and then also some principle how to adopt the new technology emerging technology and the third one is risk management it compromise it risk management outsourcing and cyber security in terms of the cyber security we also already issued the consultative paper about the new regulation on cyber security and currently we have already accepting so many input from the industry and the fourth element is collaboration this is the platform sharing between the bank and its group and also the collaboration between financial institution and non-financial institution and the fourth one and the last one is institutional arrangement it includes the finance and investment culture leadership organizational design and talent all of these five elements will become uh, in the end it will de depends on the how the banks solve the customer so that's why we have the customer as the final goal and then in the customer we will look at the customer engagement customer experience customer insight customer trust and perception and last but not least the most important part is how the bank deal with the customer with disability such as the uh, someone who doesn't have the hand or eyes which is if they don't have hands of course they cannot use the mobile app to uh, do their banking transaction and we hope that the bank will not forget about this customer so they can also provide the service to this customer as well and the uh, next slide i think uh, what uh, of course innovation uh, as the Steve job mentioned innovation distinguish between leader and a follower and we want our bank become the leader in the financial sector and that's why we try to encourage the banking to transform themselves from conventional into digital and this is the way we try to facilitate the transformation process ladies and gentlemen once again i would like to thank extend my sincere appreciation to the organizing committee for this this webinar i hope that participant of this webinar will benefit from our today discussion and in conclusion uh, this pandemic is far from over many of us are anxious and asking when will things will get back to normal of course we don't have the answer for this today life may be not the same after the uh, covid 19 pandemic there are so many unknowns and uncertainty happen right now and of course we must also adapt to the current situation and also the condition and i hope that the god will bless us and provide us with the good health so we can uh, go through this pandemic in the next uh, in the very short futures thank you so much uh, give it back to miss dharma thank you thank you very much for your comprehensive presentation, Mr. Tony, because uh, we need a regulator uh, 
your background is uh, uh, professional experience from a junior bank supervisor of Central Bank in Indonesia uh, from 24, and then uh, Banking Research and Regulation Department in Central Bank of Indonesia, and uh, from 2013, uh, uh, it's a Senior Analyst Indonesia Financial Service Authority, OJK, in Indonesia, and now the, uh, the Deputy of Director Indonesia Financial Service Authority, OJK, Indonesia, and his uh, education from law school, uh, University of uh, Brisbane, Australia, Master of Law, uh, Boston University School of Law, uh, and Banking and Financial Law, and also uh, Bachelor of uh, Accounting from Indonesia University. Okay, uh, the last speaker, we have Mr. Ahmad Safei uh, with, uh, with the topic uh, about the strategic uh, from Indonesia Sharia banking case. Mr. Ahmad Safei is an Indonesian citizen born in Brebes in 1967. He pursued his bachelor degree in STEMIC Budi Luhur uh, in 1915. Uh, and he also worked for uh, the Edge Integration Hub and Common uh, uh, Information and Computer Engineering and master degree from also STEMIC Budi Luhur in information management in 1913. He's currently serving as director of IT operation and digital banking, Bank Sari Ahmandiri uh, from last year. He has also worked as IT operation director of uh, Bank Sari Ahmandiri in 2017. Uh, general uh, head of IT application support of uh, Bank Mandiri. Uh, and he served as vice president at Bank Mandiri Education Service uh, from 2012 as vice president of Bank Mandiri Persera. Okay, uh, Mr. Ahmad, time is your 15 minutes. Thank you, Prof. Dharma. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, everyone, and the Honorable Mr. Tony, uh, Ms. Maria, and the other participants here. First of all, I want to say thank you to Asian Institute of Technology Alumni Association for having me on this webinar. <laughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen, as we know in a pandemic era, society behavior shifted significantly where everyone is bound to adapt to technology and digitalization. This affects the banking industry to continue to update technology and digitalization so that customer can always easily access bank anywhere and everywhere. The question is what are the effects to the digitalization and then what the strategy to do to to do we apply and how the banking performance will digitalization. Today, we are talking about strategy in digital transformation and innovation, especially in Bank Sariah in Indonesia case. Uh, as, as everybody know that BSE, BSI was established on 1st of February this year. Uh, merger three uh, Bank Sariah State uh, owned by State uh, Himbara, which are BSM and then BNI Saria, BRI Saria, in which all of them are their own legacy system itself and now become a single system. Alhamdulillah, after uh, we finish the merger, we have brought the customer base on Q3, where BSI has more than 15.5 million customer with more than 3.1 million uh, mobile banking user with 1,541 outlet, uh, mean branches, 
and a total more than 247 trillion of asset. We also swear that this figure will keep growing over the time. Uh, back to the topic about digital transformation and innovation. This pandemic era, digital is a must. This shifting has pushed banking industry to accelerate digitalization in both product and services to facilitate customer access. According to Inventure, there are four mega shifts occur during the pandemic era. The first one is stay at home and then back to the pyramid, go virtual and empathic society. BSI cannot avoid this either. The special condition faced by BSE in doing this murder is pandemic situation has forced us to keep innovating so that we merge process can go smoothly, seamlessly without causing trouble to our customer in converting their account. Digital transformation has been an integral part of the rollout process. It facilitates the merger to one single system. The rollout process is done gradually so that we can keep customer experience intact. Customer are also able to fully convert account digitally by using mobile banking and chatbot. And then, sorry, and then customer who have their card on card, ITM card, will also be able to use that legacy card to transact in the BSI we have a migrate cut uh, smoothly. Mm -hmm. Alhamdulillah, more than 8.8 .8 million funding account and around 500 financing account and 726 outlet has been successfully migrated in August, 2021, early than the initial timeline on uh, November. Not only successful in migration, but with digitalization, it has a good impact on PSI performance. Alhamdulillah, in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic and the out network, BSI has shown a solid performance until Q3 2021, supported by digital transformation and innovation. BSI has gained 2.26 trillion net profit on the Q3, 37% growth year on year. Pandemic is not a hydrant for the BSI to keep growing, supported by digitalization process. It has seen growth on amount of number of user, transaction, event, fees income. BSI mobile become the primary access to all the services in which digital transaction contribute uh, in mostly in BSN digital transition growth. More than 96% of customers have done digital transaction. This is the highest channel transition compared to the others. By October 2021, BSI mobile user has reached more than 3.2 million along with the growth of transition such as merchant, e-commerce, and e-wallet as well. Currently, BSI adopt bionic banking strategy, where BSI applies shifting to several banking services digitally, while still provides services in brands. In this application, we divided the services into two parts. First part, BSI Mobile will accommodate all less complex transactions starting from open account, payment transaction, purchasing, online transfer, retail funding, investment, and GISPAP all can be done through BSE Mobile. And the second one, brands, will still exist as financial advisory, where it will accommodate more complex service, such as wholesale banking product. Saria Banking has unique value 
compare with other banking where financial, social, and spiritual value are inseparable. All the value are provided by BSE Digital Banking Service 24 by 7. From BSE Mobile, from BSE Mobile, customer will be able to check prayer schedule, pay Jiswaf, Hajj, and Umrah, and so on. All of this are realized by establishing strong digital mindset from inside the BSI team and Sharia ecosystem, collaboration expansion. There are a lot of Sharia ecosystem we can develop further, which will enable to improve Sharia financial inclusion. We also improve our digital capability. BSI is currently preparing a holistic capability from from end, middle end, to back office, such as we build super apps, preparing to be open banking by actively participating in Bank Indonesia payment system uh, blueprint. To improve experience by developing single origination system, CRM and enterprise integration. And we prepare digital twin core which will accelerate product and services development and partner collaboration and integration. We also prepare robotic process automation to automate a process to work a no operation concept. We understand that term of omnichannel, but as for now, people are calling it as a super app. This uh, super S mean all the services, features, and product is accessible through one mobile banking app. And this is exactly what we provide through BSI Mobile. We believe banks should open up open banking concept. API infrastructure has enabled us to develop open banking. We all pro where all the product commodities inside the SI ecosystem will be available in third party application. So not only uh, from a banking channel. Digitalization is meaningless without collaboration. We continue to collaborate with various ecosystem partners such as GSWAP, healthcare, uh, travel, industry and other financial institutions such as wallet, fintech, and so on. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, while we are continue to develop digital services and product, we also improve our security capability. Security become an important thing in terms of transactional. BSI continue to improve security and BSI also educate our customer to maintain customer account security, such as being prohibited from sharing OTP, user ID, password, PIN, and so on. This is uh, what uh, we share with you from Bank Sare Indonesia while uh, merger process. So you can imagine that we merge while pandemic uh, COVID-19 happened. Thanks God, uh, digitalization uh, help us to serve better and then to finish the merger process uh, with uh, smoothly. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's interesting uh, presentation, uh, Mr. Ahmad. We have a uh, panel discussion. Uh, we have three also very good uh, panelists. First is uh, Mr. Konrad Hendarto, uh, is a former senior advisor of Minister of Village Development in this affected region and Transmigration uh, Indonesia and member of Association of Indonesia Islamic Economists. 
He has also worked as a lecturer in Trisakti University Jakarta, Indonesia. He is also chairman of the governing board Indonesia Philip Entrepreneur Association and the chairman of the Silver Board uh, Indonesia Transmigration Posterity Association. He is also a member of Central Board of Institution Environment and Natural Resources, uh, uh, Luma Council. Uh, he, he alumni of CERT uh, ASD 1930. And the second uh, Panelists, we have uh, Ms. Uh, Sripeni Puspa Sari Sugianto, alumni of IM94, uh, founder of Golden Style Management TA Limited Singapore. Uh, she has more than 60 years of working experience in multinational companies based in Indonesia, Thailand, and Singapore. She contributed to several supply chain role and three years in marketing. In 2012, uh, she started her own journey by setting up company in Singapore as business management and general trading. She was assigned as a business development director of Indonesia Market Research Company and led several projects in Singapore and Shanghai. During her assignment, she has successfully set up a joint venture market research in Yangon with stakeholders from Indonesia, Thailand, and Myanmar in 2017. She entered the retail industry as curator and create uh, activation trim called uh, Asia. And the last uh, panelist, we have uh, Mr. Palita Gamag Gamayel. Taking time for 10 minutes. Okay, start from Dr. Conrad, please. Uh, because uh, the basically bank have traditional proprietary core piece of utility, value of store, the ability to store money uh, safely, uh, investment uh, uh, category, and second money movement, the ability to move uh, our money safely and Third is access to credit, especially uh, SME business, uh, because it's um, uh, mostly uh, its business model uh, activity in a village uh, area. Okay, Ms. Dr. Conrad, time is your. Okay, thank you, Prof. Dharma. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, Sawadikap. His Excellency Dr. Nafid Anwar, the Vice President of Asian Institute of Technology, is uh, our lovely campus. Miss Maria Fi, our President EIT alumni. Dr. Tony, Mr. Ahmad Sefi, and also Professor Dharma. It is our, it is an honor for me invited as a panelist in this prestigious international webinar. May I present this topic based on my experience serve as a civil servant in the Ministry of Philips. My topic is Prospect and Challenge Digital Sariah Banking for Rural Economic Development in the New Normal, normal Era. I'm sorry, I haven't uh, sharing. Sharing. Maybe can somebody help me to share? Okay. I have a problem to share. <laughs> Fee or others can help for the sharing. Okay, I got it. Is okay my presentation? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah.
Yeah. So the title is a prospect and challenge digital Syariah banking for rural economic development in the new normal era. I put the logical framework just like that. So it is that the COVID-19 has an impact to our economy. Uh, many people lay off, they lost their job, and the effect is that they have to back to their home country, their, their homeland. Yeah. That happened the de-urbanization, the impact of COVID, the migration people from urban back to the homeland. So it is the impact directly. What happened during the de-urbanization, the they back to the village. So I just go directly to, to the village because I working in the Ministry of Village. Based on um, our experience, the people who they move to their home country, their homeland, they to be a farmer because in Indonesia, they have, we have good facilitated for the agriculture. We see here in the Indonesia that big country, 91% of Indonesia area is in the rural area. Yes, 91% is in the rural area. And then the number of fillets is 74,900. 57 or almost 75,000. It is a number of fillets in Indonesia. The potential in the fillets mainly is the agriculture. We can see here that 82% the potential is for agriculture. Even it is for food crops, for corn, for cassava, and also for plantation is 26.8%. Plantation is for example for palm oil, rubber, tea plantation, etc. And also fishery, 70%. And for it's nice, the village tourism, 2.5%. Beautiful scenery, fresh air in the mountain, clean sea. So we can see fish in the water, in the sea. And also uh, we have 1.8 million units of micro, small, and medium enterprises. It is our potential in the village. And then, how the agriculture, uh, agriculture contribution from, uh, from the village during pandemic COVID-19. We see here in Indonesia, in the second quarter 2020, GDP of agriculture sector is 16.24%. Meanwhile, the GDP national is minus 4.19. So we can see here that is very high the uh, differences. In the third quarter 2020, GDP agriculture sector is 2.15. Meanwhile, the GDP national minus 3.45. And the end, the data I have in the second quarter of 2021, GDP agriculture sector is 12.93. Meanwhile, the GDP national is better, become 3.31 positive. But the agriculture sector still very high. So we can see here that agriculture in the village, they have a very good potential during the pandemic. So when we, if you, the new era, we have to prepare how we can optimize the potential in the village, particularly for the Agriculture, I'm sorry, this is the, 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 the data GDP, BSD GDP. Okay, now we move to digital banking and Sariah banking. As presented nicely by Dr. Tommy and also 
Mr. Ahmad Safei and experiences in Philippines presented by Ms. V on digital banking. Now let me show you how the readiness in Russia fields for digital banking briefly. So we move to the fields right now. It is possible or not the digital banking if we apply in the fields. We can see the readiness of the village. We have a potential for digital banking. We see here that of people in the village, they have 92%, they have mobile phone. So don't worry, Pak Ahmad Safi, Pak Tony, that in the village, mainly people, they already have a handphone, mobile phone. And also the internet network is uh, built by the Ministry of Information and also with the Ministry of Village, almost 84% all the village is covered by the internet network to the village. So it is possible if the bank in digital banking go to the village in Indonesia. It is a little bit difficult in the remote area because there is no electricity, so there is no internet network in there. And then we can see also the potential for the Shariah banking. Yes, the village, the readiness village potential for Shariah banking. Shariah economic in rural area are applied in harmony with the local wisdom for long time, long time ago. It's Ready, the people they know about the how area economic in the village. The potential developed area market is highly accepted since number of product productive aids. It means the people the age is 15 up to 64 here. This is 64 point for 64 percent. The total Muslim in the village area is 86 percent. So many people in the Philips also they are Muslim. So they will receive the value of Muslim. The role of productive aids people very significant. They have know how on IT production and share of income inefficient and effectively. The presence of Islamic economic system in rural area will be able to become an alternative improving the lives of rural communities, the majority of whom are in poverty. This capability refers to the principle and practices of Islamic economics that prioritize the balance of individual and group needs to achieve prosperity or falah. Okay, we move again. The if we're talking about the Sariah banking or Sariah economics, we can see here what is the Sariah banking or what is the Sariah economics. If we compare with the conventional in the Sariah banking make investment that do not violate of Maghriba. Okay, I will explain about that, Maghriba. Why, uh, at this time, the conventional banking investment my halal or haram. It's okay, everything. But in the Sari banking, it's only for halal. And then in the Sari banking, based on profit sharing principle, that is sell, buy, rent, and services. Meanwhile, in the conventional, based on interest and profit oriented. And the Sariah banking is profit and falah oriented. The relationship in the Sariah banking with customer in the form of partnership, while in the conventional banking is relationship with the customer in the form of debitor and collector. And the next Sariah banking, they have the collection and distribution of fund must be in accordance with the fatwa of the Sariah Supervisory Council, is the MUI, the ULEMA. Yeah. While in the conventional banking, it is not necessary. Okay, we're talking about the Maghriba. What is the Maghriba? It is the very important that in the Wa'malah, Maghriba is maizir, is mean that gambling or, or speculative and Garor, goror is ambiguity and or deception from one of the parties. And the haram, it is clear for the haram that things 
that are forbidden in Islam. Riba is borrow with the additional return. Is haram also. Okay, it is the principle in the muamalah when we apply the Islamic banking or Islamic economic. However, the treats for the Islamic finance is the Islamic finance literate. Not all the people then know, so it is based on the result of national survey on literacy and financial inclusion in years of 2016, this done by the Financial Services Authority of Indonesia, shown that the Sariah Financial Literacy Index in 2016 is only 8.11, is very low compared to the conventional is 67.82%. So you can see that not all people, they know what is the Islamic finance, what is the Islamic banking. So we have to work hardly to give the dakwah, to give information to all the people. So the challenge for the Islamic banking and also digital banking is that too. How do we influence the people to learn about the economic sariah and learn about the digital banking, about the IT? Yeah. Don't worry that the people in the village, they already know, but it's not all. that. And also, we have the advantage that the people who return to their homeland, mainly they know about the IT not so stupid, they know. So they back to the hem homeland and then can teach their people in the village. And then we can move to Bundes Sariah. Bundes Sariah, it is the Islamic village on enterprises. So it's village, they, they can build the enterprise owned by the village. Bundes Sariah is served as intermediary microfinancial institution. There is no interest system, but loss and profit sharing are applied to accelerate rural economic growth and development. Bundes Sariah, sorry, I mentioned about the Bundes. Bundes is badan usaha milik desa. It means Islamic village own enterprises. Bundes Sariah will finance small, medium scale and rural enterprises free of interest. Moral and ethics more important rather than profit oriented. And also Bundes Sariah require support and partnership with Islamic banking and also other Sariah financial institution. So in the village, we really need support from the BSI. But Ahmad Safi'i, maybe we can, we can discuss more after that. And also in the operational development of the village economy, Bumde Sariah will provide assistance and consultation in the to its client because the profit based on the profit sharing. If client they lost, the Bumdes will not get a profit as well. Village fund allocated to support Bumdes development. So here the village fund is a Dana Desa, a part of village fund allocated to support the Bundes development in general, not only for Bundes Sariah. And profits will be allocated to the village treasury to be used for the benefit of the community. So the profit, it is not for the Bundes itself, but back to the village. Here we can see number of Bundes in Indonesia during 2016 to 2021. We here see that the number of fields in Indonesia is almost 75,000 and 45,000 they have already boom this. And the field of business majority in the finance, 40% is the finance services is only 20% and others we can see here. So if we want to uh, develop the village, you can develop from the Bundes. Okay, thank you. Sawadika, terima kasih. Uh, sorry if I take a more time. And the last 
uh, not least, I may propose to the Dr. Anwar that it is, if it is possible, the establishment of an Islamic economics and finance center at IT as well as a uh, the Grameen Bank Center in AID, if it is possible. We can discuss also later. Okay, thank you very much, Sawadika. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Conrad. Uh, interesting uh, presentation. Before uh, I ask uh, to second panelist, uh, um, Penny, uh, have you become a customer of Bank Sariah? In Indonesia before and now in Singapore. Yeah, hi, uh, Mbak Dharma. Thank you very much. Before that, that I want to say uh, for this opportunity uh, to the Professor An uh, Navid, Fay, uh, also all the distinguished speakers. Uh, yeah, actually, that I moved to Singapore since two thousand eight. So, yeah, since then, actually, in Indonesia also, I haven't been to be the uh, having a, any account in Sing, uh, Bank Syariah. In Singapore also, even that at the beginning, whenever I came here, I never heard if there any Bank Syariah or account in Singapore, which is actually there is. So for some reason, maybe they're, they're also not so published about their services. And then uh, what is your perspective on Sharia banking transformation into digital bank? Do you want to be a customer like a Muslim diaspora in Singapore? Uh, actually, digitalization is, of course, it's very uh, useful, even though in the in the convenience bank or even in the Sharia, which is currently haven't been started even. But for me, it's not only for the digitalization itself. The understanding about as the Pak Konrad already shared about what is the behind of the Sharia itself, which is I already talked or have a discussion before we opened the account also to our friends, uh, another Muslim, either not only that Indonesia, but mostly of my network also is the Singaporean Malay or Muslims in Singapore. They feel that the, the most important, I think that where the money is goes as the investment itself. That what Pak Conrad already explained about Mbak Mahriba, Gav, Gar, Gar, tadi Pak? So, Gar, yeah, in, yeah, Gar in, in short, it's a riba itself. So if they opened the account in the Bank Sharia, it's not to see the either digitalization or not, but about the feel comfortable with the investment itself and then related to their religious. So if they have to put is only for Hajj, the inf uh, like tabungan, yeah, tabungan or saving for Hajj, which is they are not touched at all, or something that not really take it as the uh, conveniency, because in Singapore is very conveniency with the ATM, with the transaction on the even handphone. Now there is most of the bank also not using token, so everything is linked up with the handphone and all the things. So uh, I think it's a uh, much better if the Sharia bank is not only the digitalization itself, but also explanation about how the dana or all the money or the uh, money itself goes to. Then digitalization is the really can add on the benefit. Okay, uh, and the last uh, then, uh, do you have uh, any recommendation? Concern with the Islamic banking going to digital? Yeah, uh, maybe it's very good if Singapore in here is a connection between the service or the system with the convention bank. Say like I'm running a shop now, and then which very convenient with the POS system. So uh, the system is can choose any of the type of the payment either with the pay lah pay now, you know, that all the all the bank, uh, convention bank in Singapore have it. And then or with the QR code or with the credit card or even with the Shopee Pay, Grab Pay and all the connection with all the modern uh, lifestyle of the payment gateway. So that's a very uh, useful for us. And then we are going to think about that and then to be add on 
And then of course, it will be a very added value for our Muslim customer. Uh, all right, uh, thank you, uh, Penny. And now we uh, come to the last panelist, uh, Palita Gamawe. Uh, Palita, uh, you have uh, uh, many experience in uh, banking. Uh, so can you uh, please uh, share uh, about the uh, your remark, uh, the situation about digital banking in Sri Lanka right now? the yes. prospect and the challenges. Yeah, thank you, Professor Dharma. Uh, I start with a small uh, background information about our country. Uh, this, our population is 21 million. We are a relatively a small country, uh, but uh, no, mobile connections. We have 30 million mobile connections. That shows uh, there are a lot of people with more than one mobile connection. Then internet users, we, it is estimated that we have about 11 million. That is about over 50% of the population are using the internet. Mm -hmm. Then social media users we, uh, is, is estimated at about 8 million. This about 40% of the population is using social media. Then if you look at the banking system in our country, there are local state-owned banks and local private banks and foreign banks. There are seven local state-owned banks, 14 local private banks and 10 foreign banks. Then if I come to the digital banking uh, side, uh, actually at the moment or uh, in the past, the predominant payment mode was checks. Now, if I give you some information, in 2018, there were 50 million checks transacted. Then 2019, it dropped to 46.8, a 7% reduction, the number of checks transacted. Then when it came to 20, 2020, number of checks reduced to 33.6, which is a 28% reduction compared to 2019. Therefore, number of check transactions are dropping steeply. But if you look at uh, internet banking transactions, in 2018, there had been 27 million. 2019, 36.5 million, which is 36% increase. And when it came to 2020, there had been 57 million internet banking transactions. This is another 56% increase over the 2019 figure. Then we look at mobile banking. In 2018, there had been 8 million transactions. 2019, there had been 17 million, which is 115% growth over 2018. And when it came to 2020, there are about 25 million mobile banking transactions. Again, a 40% increase. This, in, in short, check number of checks being transacted is dropping. And this electronic payment methods like internet banking and mobile banking are increasing. Now, how is this transformation taking place? I mean, this doesn't happen automatically. A lot of planning, investments, strategies have gone into this transformation. Now, our regulator, the Central Bank of Sri Lanka, has set up a company called, named Lanka Clear Private Limited. This company is owned by Central Bank, as well as all the commercial banks in the country. Actually, this company was first set up to facilitate check clearing. Now, in 2010, they introduced a technology called CITS, that is Check Imaging and Transaction Systems, where when a customer sub, uh, presents a check at the bank branch, it is scanned and the image is sent for clearing. Prior to that, the physically the check was sent to the clearing house for clearing. Mm -hmm. Therefore, except for the uh, Colombian suburbs, other areas, it took three days to clear a check. Certain uh, remote areas, it took five days to clear a check. Once the CITA system was introduced, entire country became one day clearing. Now, of course, uh, IRED is now this company which was set up to facilitate check clearing is now working very hard to reduce the number of checks being used and promote electronic payment systems. 
now actually if uh, now the most predominant now one of the predominant tools in the country and india in the world i presume is the atms earlier any atm of a bank is was linked to only the account in that bank therefore customer couldn't use an atm from another bank and withdraw money then this lanka clear introduced what is called a common atm switch where all the banks were linked to this common atm switch so that a uh, customer of bank a could walk into the atm of bank x and withdraw the money therefore all the atms were connected uh, through this common atm switch that was done in 2013 then in 2015 they introduced another uh, innovation called common electronic fund transfer switch that is called cef this real time fund transfer from one bank account to another customer's account in another bank say customer of bank a can transfer money to a customer of say bank b on real time using this common electronic fund transfer switch that was introduced in 2015 then they introduced another thing called common point of sale switch that is debit card transactions uh, you know uh, banks issue debit cards and they go to a say supermarket and it is uh, acquired by another bank uh, post machine point of sale machine and other bank has settled it now all this uh, transaction was routed from acquiring bank to the issuing bank issuing bank is the bank which holds the account through international uh, payment pro- uh, service providers like uh, visa and mastercard this involve lot of foreign exchange going out of the country therefore this uh, we have introduced this common post system so that all the local transactions are routed locally so that there is no foreign exchange going out of the country then another interesting innovation they have done is what is called a just pay platform just pay is actually it's a brand name what uh, now that is for mobile banking apps now in the past say uh, a mobile banking app of a, of bank a could be con- linked to an account of bank a only now what this uh, just pay platform has done is they have made mobile app owners independent of the banks which hold the accounts of the customer now uh, that bank is called issuing bank the mobile app owning bank is called the acquiring bank now uh, issuing banks have to separate the register with the just pay platform and the acquiring banks who are the mobile app owners have to join the platform separately so that we have made mobile app owning bank independent of the issuing bank say customer of bank a the uh, customer who is having an account in bank a could download mobile app of bank c and link it to the his account in bank a so that uh, mobile app and the issuing bank is independent of each other this has helped the smaller banks uh, greatly some of the smaller banks do not operate their mobile app, but they can simply join the just pay platform as an issuing bank so that uh, this bank's customers can download a third party mobile app and link it to the his account in the small bank and obtain all the mobile banking services therefore this has widened the scope of mobile bank uh, usage then uh, we are into uh, uh, promoting the uh, qr codes Uh, that is also happening and also another next thing is the online onboarding of customers to open accounts and open fixed deposits but that has been somewhat slow because our regulator has imposed strict uh, guidelines on these things because uh, they are very concerned about this aml what is called anti money laundering uh, therefore uh, this online onboarding of customers had been uh, difficult until recently but now they have relaxed the regulations and allowed what is called ekyc kyc is know your customer because bank has to know all the details about the customer before opening an account and now they are allowed ekyc that is electronic know your customer and also vkyc which is called video kyc the bank can talk to the customer on a on a video 
store store it and then open the account without the customer physically visiting the bank now these are the new developments happening once this kyc things are relaxed i think there will be more and more online onboarding of uh, on, uh, customers for account opening and uh, opening of fixed deposits these are the developments happening uh, in sri lanka and uh, i think if, uh, we are uh, moving in the correct direction like uh, rest of the world uh, thank you professor dharma for inviting me for short presentation i hand it back to you uh, you welcome uh, palita uh, palita is my classmate so he's alumni from som uh, 93 uh, and uh, after he I remember you also got a award from AIT, yeah? uh, the best student, uh, you and uh, Ray from Philippines, I think, uh, top uh, in our uh, class. Uh, he uh, have a career banking with over 30 years experience uh, as a head of the CEO of uh, Host Development Finance uh, Center Bank of Sri Lanka and before he uh, Uh, head of uh, corporate credit of uh, Fardana Bank in uh, Sri Lanka. You are welcome, uh, uh, Valita. Uh, Thank you. Okay, uh, now we have a limited time for uh, Q&A uh, session. There is a first uh, question from Abbas Ali. Uh, hello, Abbas Ali, are you there? Uh, what is the role of central bank for developing and supporting such digital banking system? So, uh, yeah, I, I can answer that. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, uh, in the Philippines, we have the Banco Central ng Pilipinas and uh, Banco Central ng Pilipinas is, of course, the regulatory bank of all the banks. Uh, whatever kind of banks it is. And uh, they guide a bank from the start when they are applying for a license. And uh, they have all the, these qualifications and the qualifications would involve the investments that will be made, how much it is, as well as the qualifications of the people who are actually to become the shareholders and the officers. And then when they have approved or given the license to the bank, they monitor the bank. So it is part of the, the arrangement with the bank that the that the bsp can actually visit their bank check their all their documents and see whether they're actually complying with all the requirements so it's from uh uh from the start up to the monitoring and at the same time um there is uh there's another question that says how are the bank how are the uh the people protected, the, the those who are banking. Uh, in the Philippines, we have the Philippine Depository uh, in, uh, Company, the PDIC, that guarantees that a certain amount up to a certain limit of your deposits are actually guaranteed. So if anything happens, like a bank will close, then you can actually get uh, returns of your deposits up to the limit that is allowed by law. So those that's the role of uh, the BSP that we have here in PDIC. And of course, there are a lot more of laws that will uh, protect not only the shareholders, but of course, protecting the uh, the customers, the bank users. Thank you. I hope that is uh, uh, answered. Uh, I think in the presentation a while ago of Tony, he also mentioned how uh, the Central Bank of Indonesia are protecting the uh, the people who are using the banks. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Faye. The second question to Mr. Tony from uh, Beverly, uh, but I think Tony already done. Uh, Uh, the answer for uh, Beverly. So I continue to the third question. We are aware about the voice recognition technology and braille uh, gadget. Yes, we encourage bank to adopt uh, the technology as well so that bank can provide services to customers with disability. Maybe uh, Mr. Safei or Fe also? Yeah. Okay. 
Tech technology. Oke, okay, Budan Ma. Oke, okay, one of technology that we are going to apply is a biometric. Voice recognition is one of a biometric uh, technology that currently on our development. So let's say that we plan to use that for uh, for uh, something like customer uh, uh, authentication for the our call center, for example. Yeah. So that we can uh, recognize this is a correct customer or not. This is one of our biometric. For the face recognition, we already implement. And for the voice one, uh, we are on the development uh, team. Thank you, uh, And then uh, next uh, is also to Mr. Safei, how about the security? Uh, because there's a uh, 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 computer crime in banking. I think uh, regulator not only protect the customer, also they also uh, have to protect the banking because some there are some uh, any uh, hacker or they uh, face the problem of weakness of the banking if they not uh, provide the uh, properly technology in digital banking. Okay. Uh, bank never stop improving security capability, including uh, hardware, software, uh, pattern, data, and so on. Uh, this is never ending process. Too. For me, not only the technology security, but also we, we, we continue improving our customer uh, security awareness. This part of the, our security team. So we think that we understand that uh, fraudster keep trying, keep trying. That's why for bank, for our bank, uh, security is never stop uh, improving. This is my answer. Uh, okay, uh, finally, uh, before we uh, come to the end of this uh, global webinar, uh, our uh, dear new president, AIT Alumni Association, Mr. Uh, Tawikal, before he will give a uh, confidential remark. So I want to uh, uh, ask uh, all the speaker and the, all the panelists about the conclusion from uh, maybe from the uh, uh, woman. Uh, Fe, uh, Penny, and then uh, uh, Mr. Tony, Mr. Safei, uh, Mr. Conrad, and Mr. Uh, uh, Palita. So what is your uh, conclusion? Only uh, about uh, half a minute. <laughs> so uh, conclusion okay. about the uh, prospect and the challenge digital uh, or digital banking in the future. Uh, as for me, uh, we cannot go away from the digital age. Uh, it's something that we have to absorb and we have to embrace. What is important here is that uh, we have to take a look at uh, all the combination of uh, uh, important matters that will make it uh, uh, successful. One is the readiness of the organization then the readiness of the people who are running it, and finally the readiness of uh, all the uh, people who are using the banks or the financial services that, that will make all the difference in making this succeed. Thank you, Thank you. Fe. Thank you, Fe. And uh, Penny, can you solve yeah. the question? Okay, uh, yeah, actually that I, I've, I haven't mentioned that uh, I'm part of the member of the Sharia Economic Community Network, which established in Singapore and then is uh, initiated or facilitated by Bank Indonesia, Central Bank of Indonesia. So uh, it's, uh, it's very good or initiative from the Central Bank of Indonesia, which is every country actually have this uh, community, uh, community the, which is we want to really make an information. And then there is a sharing session also every Saturday. I think I already talked to Pak Konrad also. Pak Konrad also one of the member and the anggota ya, ya, as the Masyarakat Ekonomi Syariah, uh, Economic Syariah Community, which is a working uh, working group in each country. So uh, every Saturday afternoon, I think uh, bi-weekly uh, sharing session, how that this Syariah Ekonomi becoming uh, a more connecting each other, each every countries and everything. It's not only for the banking itself, but also how to help the 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 economic 
or the SME uh, itself to make the, the more in, uh, innovative or more understandable about the concern. And then being in the Singapore also is very happy to do so since that you know that Singapore is very multinational, mostly religious and multi uh, all the people. So even though in the hawker center, they really appreciate about that halal and non-halal uh, tray, written tray. Some. So we just feel comfortable with all the differences we appreciate on that. Hopefully we can do more uh, in terms of digitalization or financial banking as me as a business also. Maybe of course or our colleague, not only for business, for, for day-to-day uh, transactions will be helpful is even more or bigger or easier for us to do transaction. Uh, okay, I think because the time is limited, uh, uh, Dr. Conrad already uh, gave a recommendation for AIT to establish an uh, Islamic center, uh, not only Grammar Bank in AIT, uh, uh, because there is prospect uh, in the future. Uh, and uh, my conclusion is uh, uh, representative all the uh, the rest of uh, speaker uh, and panelists, there is uh, only one market and the customer uh, and the player is the same. So the important thing is the competition. Uh, if bank, a bank give uh, best uh, services to customer, the customer will trust uh, because they have experience and the future uh, digital banking is uh, analog with the Gen uh, Z or millennial customer, because we are still have a colonial, uh, we call it colonial or baby boom uh, customers. Uh, we have to serve uh, them also. Uh, mostly them are not uh, 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 friendly with the gadget or the uh, 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 sophisticated technology. Okay, now we can, uh, uh, here about the collaboration remote from our dear new AIT Alumni Association President, Mr. Tawi, uh, Kun Tawija. Time is yours. Uh, Kun Tawija, please unmute. Uh, Kun Tawija, can you please unmute? Kun Tawija, you still... Yeah. Okay. I found out. Okay. Yeah. I'm very glad to be with this morning. Uh, very, very important. Both speakers and panelists make me myself understand more about this uh, digital banking. I think this is one of the, uh, what to say, signature activity of FAE huh? to have this series continue. I think I must follow this step because not only getting alumni closer together, but it also a kind of social contribution activities to the society, which is really important law. Also, not only alumni for alumni, but alumni get together for public I think this is one thing that I try to try to to do this. Anyway, I thanks a lot for all qualified, over qualified, and very impressive uh, contribution this morning. Uh, hope that in the future we will get your participation and come to join with the Alumni Association for other, maybe more interesting activities together. Thank you very much. Terima kasih. Terima kasih kembali, Kun Tawichai. Okay, so thank you very much uh, to all wonderful speakers, all competent panelists, very good uh, participant, our small team, Sreya, Wins, and other from AIT Solution, AIT Lab, AIT uh, Graduate Club, AIT Extension, uh, who supported this uh, global webinar as well organized. Uh, giving close applause uh, to them. So, 
uh, see you in the next uh, uh, interesting event. So giving us more beneficial to other, to our society, to our planet, and uh, for our prosperity. See you. Thank you very much, everyone, everybody. Thank you.